Well, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm uh, glad that you're a part of this uh, class that uh, we're beginning uh, today. Uh, this is uh, the life school class, the forerunner school class, uh, becoming an eternal purpose house of prayer or an eternal purpose house of prayer. Uh, I'm really excited about it. It's, uh, I really had just a strong burden, a strong desire um, as part of the forerunner school to raise up forerunners and to raise up the end time church uh, as a house of prayer. Uh, and I'll go into some definition of what I mean by house of prayer here in just a minute. But I've had this real heart uh, to raise up uh, a people, a company of people who would become an end time house of prayer based on God's eternal purpose. Um, from my experience over the time that I've uh, been leading life school and other things as a pastor and other, th other uh, issues and situations, uh, I've, what I've found is that very few people who are praying into God's eternal purposes or praying into some of the uh, issues that are just necessary to transition the, uh, the church from this age, from the church age to the age to come. And so I've had this real tremendous um, heart for really quite a while uh, for this class and I'm excited about it uh, and I hope you will be as well but more than being excited about it I really hope that what can, will come out of this is that there will be individuals uh, even if you're not involved in a in a church and you're on your own somewhere there will be individuals there will be small groups of two or three or five people gathering together or full churches or even beyond that, even citywide uh, situations maybe in a few places where uh, you come together uh, to pray into these various uh, issues. They're very important and as you'll see when we get into this, it's a key dynamic that is uh, really critical in terms of, uh, uh, of initiating the, the transition from the church age to the age to come. So very important, and I, I really pray that each and every one of us who watch this and listen to it, read the notes, will not only just learn about it, but will actively get involved in becoming a member of God's house of prayer uh, in these last days. This, I do wanna say this, for those of you who've been involved in life school in the past, uh, this would probably be predominantly the the African uh, brothers that will be watching this, uh, this material, being a part of this material, part of the Forerunner School. Uh, this is a compliment to the Becoming a House of Prayer class uh, that, w that was part of the Church Transformation Project and still part of Life School. You can still access it on our website, radicalpursuit.net. Um, this is a compliment. We're not trying to use this to replace it. Uh, just to give you a little bit of explanation, uh, um, Originally, I was trying to make this class a replacement for that, but there, there's a lot of material in that other class that is good, and it is more of a foundational uh, type of thing on prayer as a general uh, sense, whereas this class uh, focuses on prayer based on the summons to the golden altar and God's eternal purpose. And so there's some different issues and different things that we're trying to, uh, uh, to use here. So it doesn't replace it, it complements uh, that. Um, just one more word of introduction and then we'll get into the teaching. Uh, there, there are really uh, kind of three things that I want to try to accomplish with this class. Uh, one is to uh, just kind of a couple of different issues that kind of flow together. The summons to the golden altar, which we'll get into in a few minutes, uh, and, God, and praying into God's eternal purpose. And they kind of blend together as one, but we want to you to understand those two dynamics, the summons to the golden altar, because I do believe that not only have I in our church been summons to the golden altar, I do really believe that it's a... It's an issue where the where forerunners and even the entire end time church has been summoned to the golden altar to fill the incense bowls with the prayers of the saints. Uh, and then a similar dynamic that flows together with that is, is praying into God's eternal purpose. And so we wanna tie those things together as well as the understanding that as forerunners, we have to pray into these issues uh, 
we, we have to become those who participate in, uh, in prayer and into the issues around the, around the golden altar as well as God's eternal purpose. Uh, you, you know, our mentor, uh, Noel Mann, used to say that you cannot be a forerunner without being an intercessor or one who will pray, and I totally agree with that. Forerunners must be men and women of prayer. So we want to tie all that together as we go through uh, the various sessions uh, in this class. So anyway, with that introduction, I want to pray, and then uh, we'll begin this session, session one, which is called Summoned to the Golden Altar. Summoned to the Golden Altar. So let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much for this class, for this session, for those who will be watching it, listening to it, and studying the notes. We do ask, Father, that you would, out of this class, raise up a people who would become a, pe a people, a company of people, join the company who would be praying into God's eternal purpose as they are summoned to the golden altar. We pray for your anointing upon this session. I do ask, Lord, that you would take me out of the way and let me merely be a, a mouthpiece, a voice for your, for your words to your people. Uh, pour out your spirit and your anointing. Apart from you, I can do nothing, but you can speak boldly to your people, and I ask that you do that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's start. We're summoned to the golden altar. Uh, I'm going to try to kind of follow the notes fairly closely and read from them as necessary because there's a lot of information uh, in there. We'll see how that goes, but that's my intent. Uh, we want to talk. I want to talk first about uh, the church as a house of house of prayer. Uh, let's go to Mark chapter 11, starting with verse 17, or actually just verse 17. Uh, this is the words of Jesus. He, Jesus, began to teach and say to them, Is it not written that my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a robber's den. So, but the call was that his God, Jesus is saying, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. And, and what I want to do as we begin this session is I want to look at those three concepts. House, prayer, and nations. Uh, house, prayer, and nations. Let's talk about a house, a uh, house of prayer. Now, most of you, probably all of you know that in the last 10, 20 years, and, and maybe much longer than that, there have been many um, ministries that, that have erected and built houses of prayer, uh, buildings and uh, you know, parts of buildings are uh, dedicated to, to prayer, many of them 24-7. And, and around the world, it's been a great and a powerful movement uh, about uh, building a house of prayer. Um, and for those of you who are doing that or want to do that or have the call to do that, that's great. I, I'm all for those kind of uh, ministries that are set apart totally as a house uh, of prayer. But I, w I don't want to limit what I'm talking about to what, I, what we would think of as a house of prayer, uh, something like IHOP in Kansas City or different places where it's a 24-7 uh, facility dedicated totally to prayer. That's great if you have the resources and have the people and the call and are the anointing to do that. Uh, but what I'm talking about is far bigger than that. Even if you're in, uh, by yourself, uh, in your living room, uh, alone praying, you can be a house of prayer. Uh, so that I'm talking about that. I'm talking about a prayer, a functional prayer, uh, prayer ministry within a local church, uh, a, a group of people gathered together, and possibly a, a group in the city, in a city, coming together to pray. So we're talking about that uh, as a as a spiritual house. In fact. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, I want to read uh, a couple of verses there. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. And coming to him as a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. Uh, that's talking about Christ. But then he says, you, Peter says, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house 
for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so what, what does Peter say? Peter says that we're, the, what God is building in, this, in the New Testament era <clears throat> is not a, a physical structure. I mean, we can have physical structures, and that's great if we all need them, but that's not the house. The house is a spiritual structure of a, of a living stone put together with other living stones that come together to build up a, a spiritual house, a spiritual house that offers up spiritual prayers, that offers up a, a spiritual work uh, unto God. Now, when Jesus came and spoke these words, when he spoke it in Mark 11, there was a temple there, and it was a house of prayer. He wanted that to be a house of prayer and not a place of merchandising and uh, corruption and many other issues that were not right there. Uh, but with the coming of the New Testament at the, in the book of Acts, it, the, the temple was destroyed, and the house is now, uh, the, the temple and the house is now us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the house. And so what God is saying when he's talking about my house shall be a house of prayer, he's talking about individual uh, believers coming together uh, as, a, as a living stone, coming together to build a spiritual house, a spiritual house that can offer up spiritual sacrifices. And so that's the first thing. I'm look, still looking at this passage in Mark chapter 11. We saw, he says, my house shall be a house of prayer. First point is that it's a spiritual house. doesn't have anything to do with the building, doesn't have anything to do with a, a something totally dedicated uh, to prayer. Now, the second point is that I want to talk about is prayer. What we're talking about here is prayer that will ascend to the heavenly golden altar, prayer that will... Uh, fill the incense bowls, and we'll look at those scriptures in a few minutes. Fill the incense bowls, uh, prayers that will uh, effectively transition the earth uh, from the church age to the age to come, uh, that are focused, so golden, prayers are focused, that ascend to the golden altar, and prayers that... that uh, are focused on God's eternal purpose, God's eternal purpose. And so, you know, those of, many of you have been in part of the Forerunner School, and the Forerunner School we're, uh, have just finished the, uh, li the Forerunner School class, the Life School class, uh, the eternal blueprint. And so you understand God's eternal purpose. And we'll go back into that in the next session. We'll actually do some review there. But uh, those, but, God's eternal purpose and all the elements of that have to be prayed into reality. There's a prayer element to see them fulfilled in the life of the church. And so when we're talking about eternal purpose house of prayer, we're talking about prayer that ascends to the golden altar, but also, and really there's a, a great overlap there, uh, prayer into God's eternal purpose. <clears throat> so we're, we're talking about a house, spiritual house, focused on God's uh, prayers of God's eternal purpose. And then the third aspect, the third concept I want to talk about uh, is nations, is nations. Now, if you look at that word uh, nations, and I'm going to turn to the notes here so I can get, uh, <clears throat> get a little fairly, uh, get some of the detail here. If you look at the word nations, it's the word, Greek word ethnos, <clears throat> which doesn't necessarily, it does include, but not necessarily only what we would think of as a geographic nation like United States or Canada or England or, uh, you know, a nation in Africa, Kenya or whatever. I mean, it does include that, but it also includes uh, a people group uh, with similar interests, similar customs, similar traditions. Let's look at some of the meanings of the word here, of the word Greek word ethnos. This word means a multitude of people, a company, or a nation. Uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon states that it refers to a multitude who are associated or living together, and also a company or multitude of individuals of the same nature or genus, a race, or a nation. Kittle's uh, Theological Dictionary uh, 
says the word originates from ethos, which carries the meaning of a habit or a custom. So as we combine the various meanings of this word, the idea emerges that Jesus is calling his church to pray for the multitudes of people who don't believe in or follow Christ, for people groups who hold to certain, uh, to certain customs and habits which are in opposition to Christian values, and for literal nations who oppose Christ and his people. Uh, and as well as it is for uh, people who do believe in Christ uh, and for, to pray for the fullness uh, of God's purposes in an original intent to come forth for them. So it includes the lost, it includes the saved to come into maturity, and it includes the nations of the earth, the literal geographical nations. It includes uh, people groups who hold a certain customs and values that may uh, need to be prayed uh, into God's purposes, transition into God's purposes, uh, or even to come to Christ. So when we're talking about a house of prayer, we're talking uh, about a spiritual house focused on uh, God's eternal purpose and f filling the golden incense bowls for individuals uh, as well as groups of people, whether they be a geographical nation or not. But it does include the geographical nations uh, of the earth. So anyway, I hope that gives you kind of a little bit um, uh, idea of where we're headed there and try to maybe if there's any kind of misconceptions about what we're talking about, about a house of prayer, that will hopefully correct those things. Um, so let's talk about next about being uh, summoned to the golden altar. That's the title of this session. Um, uh, it was really a um, dramatic encounter we had at our church in July of 2015 when Terry Bennett, and a lot of you know Terry uh, and listen to his materials. But when Terry Bennett and his team came to our church for the first time in July of 2015, uh, and we received a summons to the golden altar, and I'll give you more detail about that uh, in a minute. But what I think would be helpful is to kind of give you our journey uh, in intercession uh, over the life of our local church. Our church has been, in fact, right now, as I'm teaching this uh, in uh, 2021, our church is celebrating its 30th uh, anniversary as a church. We started in 1991. And we've been on quite a journey in terms of intercession. And maybe you're just beginning the journey as well. It's okay if you are, but hopefully our experience will help you uh, and how we've journeyed will help you to maybe uh, jump over some of the mistakes we've made and the issues we had to deal with to come right into praying into God's eternal purpose. But I do believe, as, as we'll get into this, that everybody who listens to this is, is also the end time church and the forerunners are, are being summoned to the golden altar just like we were. But let me give you a little, let me back up a little bit, give you a little bit of a, a brief history. Uh, when we first started our church in 1991, we were uh, basically organized as a cell church. So we didn't really have any sort of corporate prayer. The kind of prayer we had was in home groups or cell groups, and they were focused uh, almost totally, uh, if at all, uh, on praying for individual needs. When somebody had a was sick or whatever, we prayed for them, but we didn't have any kind of a, a prayer ministry. Uh, so that was probably the way we operated for about five years for, until 1996. And then in 1996, and of course we've said this in a number of classes and sessions, uh, our uh, spiritual mentor, Noel Mann, came for the first time from Australia to visit our church. And uh, one of the sessions, I had never met him before, and it was really a, a challenging time in a lot of ways, but one of the things that that uh, he preached on, ministered on, was becoming a house of prayer in that first time in 1996. And so here he was in, in our uh, small little church, and he was, uh, he was beginning to preach. And over the loud, uh, and he was saying, you need to be a house of prayer. And over the sound system, 
uh, it, it's a, it, was an, it was an unbelievable thing when it happened. But over the sound system, this ghoulish sounding voice came forth and it said, no, no, no. Uh, and Noel said, yes, yes, yes. Although he said it a lot louder than that, a lot more authority than that. He said, yes, 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 uh, we are called. And so we knew at that point in time that one, the enemy was trying to oppose our becoming a house of prayer, but just as much we knew that we were called to become a house of prayer. And so we started a weekly uh, Wednesday night prayer meeting uh, right after that and began with a real small number of people. I mean, my wife and I were there pretty much every week and I don't know, we never, rarely did we get over four or five, six, seven people in attendance, but we were faithful. We, I, I will say that we were faithful to pray for years actually, uh, uh, week after week after week and our prayers began to uh, transition over that time, uh, more, less and less about our local church and the needs in our local church and individual needs in our local church, and more and more into prayer for the nation and prayer for the issues that we were facing in the nation, prayer for Israel and prayer for uh, different situations that were kind of, I would say, the term I use is beyond the walls of the church. Uh, that were issues beyond the walls of our local uh, church. And so it, I, I won't say that it was great. I mean, we were mainly, it was almost like we were chiseling rocks more than just the anointing flowing, but we were faithful to do it week after week. And I remember one kind of funny story. Uh, one night, it, we Donna and I were there and we were, Nobody else had come, and so we were saying, all right, great. I mean, not great negatively, but great positively. Wow, okay, we can go home because we're not going to, if nobody else comes, we're not going to stay. We can pray at home or whatever. Uh, and so we were about ready to leave, and this couple walked through the door. Uh, I never saw them before and actually never saw them afterwards. And, and Donna and I wondered, did God send two angels uh, to come and to pray with us? I mean, they looked like humans, and maybe they were. I don't know. But they just said they'd come to pray with us. And so we prayed with them, and, and it was really, really powerful. We flowed together really good, and we, I don't remember now what the issues were, but we were really flowing uh, with them very, very, some very powerful time and so but they never came to church they never came on a Sunday morning I never saw them ever again uh, but it was a great and a powerful time uh, of prayer so you know we knew that God as hard as it was at times that God wanted us to continue to pray week after week after week uh, but then there but there got to came to be a point where we felt like okay Lord you're leading us uh, to something, we need to, there's something more than what we're currently praying and, and we weren't really sure what it was and I would actually been praying and asking the Lord to, to show us and then about that time, 2014, um, Donna, we, we felt like Donna was to start a ladies prayer group praying for the birth of the man child in Revelation 12 and uh, you know, we've, we, we've talked some about that in the classes and we'll talk more about it in Session uh, three, I believe it is, in this, in this class, we'll talk about the man-child and praying into the birth of the man-child and all of that. So she started that group, and that group was powerful, and then it eventually blended in some other groups. Uh, but still, I was thinking, Lord, okay, there's more. Uh, I'm not sure we're really hitting exactly what you want us uh, to do. Uh, and I actually tried to write a, prayer, a revised prayer class before, you know, around that time, and I could never get it written and I really believe now was the reason was that in 2015, Terry Bennett came and on, in, uh, on for a weekend conference. And on the Saturday morning session, his son Josiah was preaching that day, but uh, there was an encounter with a heavenly being, a, 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 an angelic being 
uh, came into the room, uh, and he saw it. I didn't see it, uh, but he saw it, and his daughter saw it, uh, who was there that day. And uh, the Terry said that the angelic being, what he was doing was he was summonsing us to the golden altar. He was summonsing us to the golden altar. Um, and it was a very holy moment. I mean, you, I didn't know really what in the world was happening and what the summons to the golden altar even meant. Uh, but I knew that there, were, there was the holiness of the Lord there. Uh, there it, was a, it was something real uh, was happening there. Uh, and it really has changed our prayer focus and our prayer our call to prayer ever since. Um, uh, and so there's a lot more we've got to, to go. I, I, you know, I'm not saying that our church is there yet, uh, uh, not even probably even close to where we need to, to be. Uh, but we're on the journey, so that's, that's good uh, there. But it, when, during this time, during, the, during the, this Saturday morning, uh, this is some of the things that, uh, that the Lord spoke through Terry. Um, one from Jeremiah uh, chapter 9, verse 17 through 21. This say, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider and call for the mourning women that they may come, and send for the wailing women that they may come. Let them make haste and take up a wailing for us, uh, that our eyes may shed tears and our eyelids flow with water for a voice of wailing is heard from Zion. How we are ruined, we are put to great shame for we have left the land because they have cast down our dwellings. Now hear the word of the Lord, O you women, and let your ear receive the word of his mouth. Uh, teach your daughters wailing and everyone the neighbor a dirge for death has come upon the windows and it has entered our palaces. So, uh, you know, not one of your all time encouraging words for sure, but it was a, but it, it was it was powerful in that it was a call to serious fervent uh, intercession before the heavenly golden altar uh, that included when necessary you know mourning and uh, even travailing uh, that was there uh, also that same day Romans eight twenty eight was spoken that in the same way the Spirit helps our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep from word, for words. And one of the things that the, the angelic being uh, spoke through Terry was for us to take up, and this is not just for us, but it's for all who hear this, for us to take up the burden of the Lord, the burden of the Lord, so as to birth God's solution for our time to take up the burden of the Lord to birth God's solution for our time. The summons included, I'm just reading from my notes now, the summons included a call for intense prayer for the birth of God's solutions to what we face now and will face in the future. Uh, and so there were some other scriptures and some other things uh, that uh, uh, that he, he said. Uh, so Anyway, the, uh, with that summons, uh, we knew that we were being called to a different level of prayer. Uh, now, I may talk about this more in the next session, but, uh, you know, that was as exciting as that was and as serious as that was, um, we still had a lot of under, trying to understand what it meant because, you know, a lot of people, what people would come to me afterwards and say, now, can we still pray the way we used to pray? Uh, do, can we pray, you know, for our family? Can we pray for provision and for healing? And, uh, and so I was trying to figure it out myself. And so anyway, I, I'll get in more into that, I think, in the next session. Uh, so it wasn't that, it, that everything was clear at that point, but we knew that we were summoned uh, at that uh, point. So let me talk a little, just a little bit about the word summoned. When you get a summons, it sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? A summons, uh, if you get a court summons or a summons to, 
you know, appear before a congressional hearing or something like that is a very serious thing. But the meaning of the word itself is deeply, a deeply serious demand. Uh, it's a call by an authority. It's an urgent call for someone to be present. Some, some synonyms are things like subpoena, warrant, uh, a decree, or an edict. And so basically what the Lord was saying to us, and I believe, here's what, for, it's not just us. That's why I want to keep emphasizing this. It's for every forerunner, I believe. It's for every uh, pastor who wants to build an end, a church for the end times and to have an eternal purpose house of the prayer, house of prayer. We all have been summoned to the golden altar. We've been summoned to this type of prayer. It's not an optional thing. I mean, it's not uh, something, okay, if you really feel like it, you can do it. It's a, it's a, it's a serious um, command. The, the Lord is commanding us to pray this way. And so I know, I know I am called to do that, and I'm not saying that I'm as effective at, as, at it as I need to be, but I know that's a call, and I know it's a call on forerunners who will operate in the spirit and the power of Elijah, and I know it's a call for the end time church. We must uh, take the summons, say yes to the summons, to the golden altar to pray into God's eternal purposes and those issues that will ascend and, and fill the golden bowls of incense. It's absolutely essential uh, that we do that. Let me read this from our notes. We believe that, that as forerunners in the spirit and the power of Elijah, we are to help multiply eternal purpose prayer that will ascend to the golden altar in the places that we have been granted uh, influence. Uh, so that's the call, summoned to the golden altar. So let's try to uh, help us see if we can help understand uh, the summons to the golden altar by trying to understand the golden altar. Um, when I think of the events that have to take place before there is a transition from the church age to the age to come, there are four things kind of stand out in my mind. Now, these are high-level issues, and there are other things for, absolutely for sure, and it's probably some that I haven't thought about. But the four things are this, uh, that the corporate son, the corporate man, the man-child of Revelation 12 has to be fully uh, accomplished or come into being in existence in fullness. That's one thing. Number two, the bride has to be made ready. Uh, Revelation 19.7. Uh, the gospel has to be preached throughout the nations to all the people of the earth, the nations of the earth. Uh, Matthew 24. Uh, and then the fourth one is that the uh, golden ball, bowls of incense that stand in the heavenly, at the heavenly golden altar have to be filled. Now, let's, let's look at uh, a couple of scripture verses uh, about that one, that the golden bowls of incense must be filled before the transition of the age will come. If you look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, uh, it, this, uh, this is from what John wrote. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls, golden bowls full of incense. And what are those golden bowls full of? They're full, it says, which are the prayers of the saints. Prayers of the saints. Uh, fill those golden bowls. And then Revelation, right after that, Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of the saints on the golden altar which was before the throne. 
And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and threw it to the earth. And there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Now, it's interesting that when you see Revelation chapter 5, the first scripture we read here just a minute ago, that initiates the seal judgments. And then when you see Revelation chapter 8, uh, after that, that initiates the trumpet judgments. And so what you see is these bowls of incense, which are prayers of saints that stand before the golden altar, have to be filled with the prayers of the saints, and they become incense uh, before God. Uh, and so it's a critical thing that prayers to the, before the, that ascend to the golden altar, uh, of which we have been summoned, uh, are necessary as a transition into the age to come. So let's look at the let's look at the golden altar and the tabernacle here just for a minute. You know, you've probably done studies on this. You know that. The tabernacle and the, and the temple, uh, Solomon's temple, uh, pretty much the similar pattern, but the, we'll use the tabernacle. The tabernacle had three basic uh, uh, positions. It had an outer court, it had a holy place, and it had a holy of holies. The outer court had the altar of sacrifice where all the animals were sacrificed and the brazen laver where the washing, the ceremonial washing uh, took place. Uh, the Holy of Holies had the Ark of the Covenant um, and just the different pieces related to that or furniture related to that. And then the one we were interested in right now is the Holy Place. The Holy Place had essentially three major pieces of furniture. It had the lampstand, the table of showbread, and what? The altar of incense. It had the altar of incense. Now, the... Altar of sacrifice, there's two altars here. The altar of sacrifice was made of bronze. Uh, and the altar of incense was a golden altar. Uh, and so we know that we know that the golden the altar of incense was a golden altar. So when we talk about we've been summoned to the golden altar, we know that we've been summoned to the uh, the golden altar, which is the altar of incense. Uh, now, what happened with the altar of incense? This is the way uh, it, it was used. Twice a day, uh, the priest who was on duty that day would take coals from the altar of sacrifice on a fire pan of some sort, and he would go into the holy place, uh, and he would do his ministry to the lampstand and the showbread and all that, but he would also mix the fire from the uh, altar of sacrifice with the incense and that would arise a sweet smelling incense that would arise unto God. Uh, now that incense is symbolic of prayer because if you look at Luke chapter 1 verse 10 that the, the people would be gathered in prayer at the temple uh, at the same time, the priest offered incense at the altar of incense. So it's a picture of prayer uh, ascending uh, to God. And so, let me get here in my notes. Uh, it, there's a lot in here that it, uh, that it, it, it speaks of, but it, it's prayer... Uh, that ascends under God. And, the, and there, there's some principles here is that the, the, the coals had to be taken, uh, had to be taken from the altar of sacrifice. And so, you know, in Leviticus, it talks about the offering of strange fire. And it was fire that wasn't taken from the altar of sacrifice. So it's taken from a sacrificial life Devoted to God, uh, prayers that come and, and become incense uh, unto the Lord. Now, there's another really important principle uh, that about the incense from Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 34 through 38. And I want to read this. Um, it's a little bit long, but it really makes an important 
concept about the incense. Remember, it's altar of incense. We're offering prayers which become incense to the Lord. Uh, verse 34, then the Lord said to Moses, he's talking about the incense that was given, uh, uh, used at the tabernacle of Moses. He said, then the Lord said to Moses, take for yourself spices and stactate and oinka and uh, galbanum, I'm, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing these right, spices which with pure frankincense, there shall be an equal part of each. With it you shall make incense, a perfume, the work of a perfume, or salted, pure and holy. You shall beat some of it very fine and put, and put part of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting where I will meet with you. It will be most holy to you. The incense we will, listen to this, verse 37. The incense which you shall make, you shall not make in the same proportion for yourselves. It shall be holy to you for the Lord. Whoever shall make any like it to use as a perfume for themselves shall be cut off from his people. And so in other words, the incense that was used at the altar of incense was totally devoted to God. It was devoted to God, uh, not to any kind of personal need. Uh, now, that makes a powerful statement about the kind of prayers we're praying. And we'll get more into that uh, um, in session one and then in session two uh, as well. But the prayers are for the purposes of fulfilling God's purposes, God's eternal purposes, the, the objectives that he had. It's not for meeting our own needs. Now, when we get into this in the next session, but there, we can pray for our own needs. We need to pray for our family. We need to pray for ourselves. We need to pray I mean, even Jesus said that in the Lord's Prayer, that we pray, your kingdom come and, you know, give us our daily bread, you know, forgive us of our trespasses. So we need to pray for our own needs. We need to pray for our local church. We need to pray for these things. And we'll go into that in the next session, I believe it is, a little bit more. But, but the kind of prayer we're talking about in terms of an eternal purpose house of prayer is not focused on our needs. It's not focused on our comfort. It's not focused on our pleasure. It's totally dedicated to, for the purposes of God to be fulfilled in the earth, for God's eternal plan, his eternal thought, his eternal will to be fulfilled in the earth. That's the purpose of prayers that ascend to the golden altar. Those are the kinds of prayers that will ascend uh, to the golden altar. Uh, and so that leads us, uh, we're talking now about prayers that fill the incense bowls on page seven actually in your notes uh, there uh, for that. And let's talk a little bit more uh, about the type of prayer that we're talking about as we, this will kind of lead toward the end of this session. But uh, they're pray prayers that focus on God's eternal purpose. And we talked about that. Uh, there are prayers that are offered in agreement with the intercession at the heavenly golden altar of the eternal man, Christ Jesus. This is really uh, in a, an important point. You know, we talked in the Old Testament, we talked as we talked about the tabernacle. In the Old Testament, the altar of incense was in the holy place. But if you look in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, the altar of incense is not in the, in the holy place, it's in the holy of holies. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 3. Behind the second veil, that's the, behind the veil of the holy of holies, there was a tabernacle which is called the holy of holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and so... That altar of incense is now in the Holy of Holies. Now, remember the only person in the Old Testament who could go into the Holy of Holies was the high priest. And he could only go uh, once a year. But of course, God tore the, the veil with the cross. Uh, but the high priest who is Christ uh, is the one... Uh, who can minister at the altar of incense. Now, uh, 
a scripture verse that I probably should have mentioned earlier, but I, I, I didn't, so I'll mention it now. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, uh, the author of Hebrews, probably Paul, but the author of Hebrews said, uh, wrote, or wrote that the earthly tabernacle is a pattern or a copy of what is in heaven. And so there is an altar of incense. There's a heavenly golden altar, and Christ stands to minister there. Uh, and so it's, he's, inter he's ever living to intercede at that heavenly golden altar, but he's interceding not in a random manner. He's not interceding in a random manner. Uh, he's interceding based on God's eternal purpose. And so our role is to pray in agreement with what he's praying in heaven with the will and the purposes of God from God's eternal purpose. And so, uh, now, I don't want you to get so entangled. Is, is this God's will? Is this what he's praying right now? And to the point that you can't even voice a prayer. That's not the intent of it. But the intent of it is it's not to be random. It's prayers focused upon what God's will is, what God's purposes are. Uh, so, uh, they're in to, to be in agreement uh, with the Lord. Uh, so uh, let me, the two more points and then we'll close this session. Uh, on page nine in your notes, forerunners have a threefold assignment related to God's summons to the golden altar. First, forerunners are called to pray before the golden altar. Uh, like I said earlier, we cannot be a forerunner if we are not personally praying prayers that will ascend to the golden altar focused upon God's eternal purpose. Uh, you'll not be a forerunner. You can be called a forerunner, but you won't really be a, a true forerunner without this. So for, that's the first assignment is for as forerunners that we pray that way. Second, forerunners, you know, we're forerunners are messengers. Uh, forerunners are messengers. And so forerunners as messengers must be a voice not only in intercession but also to the church, calling the church to eternal purpose prayer. Uh, it's going to take a large number of saints to fill these golden bowls of incense. And so we must be messengers. That's the second function. And the third assignment is for those who have a platform to build, whether it's a pastor, a prayer leader, or a ministry leader, uh, to be a wise master builder and to build a spiritual house uh, that's focused on God's praying into God's eternal purposes and prayers that will ascend uh, to the golden altar. Uh, and so those three assignments are ours, at least two of them. You may not have a platform to build and you can only do the, uh, the first one or the first two. Uh, but... Uh, some who can do all three. Now, the last point I want to make uh, is this. We cannot patch eternal purpose uh, prayer, God's eternal purpose, onto our current prayer ministry. We cannot just patch it on. Uh, uh, you know, it won't be sufficient to just pray. Let's say you have an hour prayer meeting and you pray for needs of the church for 45, 50 minutes of that, and in the very end you offer a sentence or two about issues related to God's eternal purpose. That's not going to be sufficient. Uh, not that we can't pray for the other things, certainly we can, but praying into God's eternal purpose and praying prayers that will ascend to the golden altar are uh, of, of ultimate, utmost importance and can't be just patched in as an afterthought into our prayer ministry. They must become the primary focus. If we're going to be an end-time church, if we're going to be a forerunner ministry, this must become the predominant uh, prayer focus of our prayer ministry. Uh, so we'll stop there on this session one. Just know that we have been summoned to the golden altar. Lord, let us all say yes to that. In the name of Jesus, amen.